I honestly don't even know how I'm gonna handle the map of this place's interior. This is gonna be a mess. But hey, at least the outside should be pretty easy. Wait, what? It, it's a GameCube controller? Welcome back everyone and everything! I am jazzed for this episode, because we're going after my personal favorite level. But we gotta find it first. The entrance to Serena Beach is hidden beneath this giant pineapple, which we can only remove by eating it with Yoshi. That's why when Shadow Mario showed up in the plaza with the egg, you got that zoom in on the top of this building. Hope you didn't mash past that, because it's the only hint the game gives you that this isn't just a tacky architectural choice. Though, strictly speaking, it is possible to get in here without Yoshi. First, let's grab a banana, banana the preferred fruit, fruit of sea runners. And take advantage of this little back step Mario does when throwing a fruit. Get your positioning just right, and Mario can step backwards straight through this roof and then just jump into the loading zone. Though be warned, since this doesn't remove the pineapple, you'll have to perform this glitch for every single level. Incidentally, I always found it odd that this pineapple doesn't actually count as a pineapple for Yoshi's purposes. Not changing his color or refilling his juice meter or anything. But I'd say that's quite enough about the entrance. Let's actually get into the level now, shall we? Episode 1, The Manta Storm. A proper welcome to Serena Beach and just look at it. Ignore all the neon slime, I mean the sunset. It's gorgeous. They've been holding out on me setting every level at midday. Let's celebrate sunshine in all its forms. And the silhouette of the park, the ferris wheel spinning slowly. Oh. Right, the goo. We've got an escalation in difficulty here. This stuff is electrifying, and not necessarily in a fun way. The worst part is that there's no way for us to spread this goop beneath the feet of unsuspecting islanders. We do have a pair of submerged Noki here though, and this is the first time we can see either of their thanks dialogue. The female is just so heartfelt, though I find it a little unsettling the male knows our name already. Well, maybe that's a good sign. Curiously, we can slide over small patches of this goop if we're hydroplaning fast enough. On the other side of the coin, even the tiniest smudge of it is enough to zap Mario if we walk over it. Mario, we gotta get you some rubber soles. My other pants were in my locker. Now the whole hotel's gone. I... Pants? Pants? I... What? Okay, we'll table the mystery of the Pianta pants for now. Arguably more pressing is the mystery of the hotel itself being gone. Presumably it got submerged in goop, but cleaning off all the foundation doesn't seem to fix that. This is an odd case of being required to talk to someone to progress the mission, which I actually appreciate, because the Piantas in this mission have some of the most helpful and entertaining dialogue in the game, so good on the mission for putting you in that mindset. <laughs> Okay, so genuine horror vibes in my Mario game. This thing is huge, it's mysterious, and it's coming straight for you. It's continuously spreading the most hazardous paint we've seen yet. Help! Meet Phantom Manta, the most bizarre boss fight in this game. It bears no resemblance to anything Mario's ever faced before. It quite literally comes out of nowhere, and it may even be a reference to Stephen King's The Shining? From the window of the presidential suite, he thought he saw a huge dark shape issue. For a moment, it assumed the shape of a huge, obscene manta, and then the wind seemed to catch it, to tear it and shred it like old, dark paper. Spraying Phantom Manta doesn't make it shrink or get washed away, but rather split into two smaller mantas, which split into three smaller mantas, which split into four smaller mantas, which also split into four mantas, giving us a potential 96 enemies in the area at once. Help! These things are brutal, relentless, and this is my favorite boss fight, not just in this game, but in any Mario game to date. These things are mysterious, but the rules they follow are clearly laid out for you organically. They're silhouettes, almost like shadows cast down from the sky, and by watching them or paying attention to the goo they spread, we can see that the underside of these huts are safe, something the game even lures you to with coins. For a new player, your priority in this fight will be finding a safe spot from which to wage watery war on these gossamer ghouls. The underside of these huts keep you safe, but the rays will stop tracking you if they can't see you. Between that and your limited water, you'll be forced to venture out of your hiding spot to refuel and make progress. As a kid, I was quite proud when I figured out that the tops of these palm trees kept you relatively safe. I assume because the shadows can't be properly cast on a surface that isn't solid? 
In addition to the superior vantage point, you've got easier access to water than you do in the huts. I felt like I'd gotten one over on the game, but in hindsight, this is also something the game lured me into figuring out with these coins. As a more experienced player now, this fight is a fantastic test of all of Mario's more advanced abilities, making use of limited safe ground to let loose with flood bursts and sprinklers, canceling out these rays as fast as they can multiply. Smart use of the hover can carve out an advantage. Like Wiggler, the key word here is escalation. The more progress you make in the fight, the harder it gets. Once there are only the smallest variety of rays remaining, they'll turn pink and all zero in on you, creating one last rush in an almost Dynasty Warriors kind of thrill. You thin their ranks until only a few more manageable shadows remain, you hunt them down one by one like the exterminator you are, and then it's over. It's perfect. I almost don't want to tell you that you can make this fight completely effortless on yourself by just heading over to this corner of the beach and picking them off from here, but hey, sandbox. Piling on the things I appreciate about this level, almost every NPC here actually reacts to the defeat of the boss, which doesn't usually happen. And even better, check this out. I think I'm beginning to see a ray of hope. A ray of hope. A few more miscellaneous details, if we look at the goop present before we get here, we can see the path Phantom Manta took from the ocean, before it turns into the shape of a manta, which is a bit weird considering how we saw it spread its ink, and then it must have just blinked out of existence once it got up here so as not to leave any further trail. We can actually get the big one stuck on the roof of a hut if we go underneath it while the center of its shadow is covering it, and then some pretty weird things can happen. This episode, we were tasked with taking down a total of 129 rays. When Nintendo unveiled the GameCube, they were really excited about how its powerful processor can handle significant amounts of entities, and showed this capability off with Super Mario 128, a tech demo featuring 128 Marios all running around on their own AI and reacting to the physics of the world they were in. This tech demo eventually became the central pillar around which Pikmin was created, but you can feel its DNA in this boss fight as well. Episode 2, the hotel- you know what, I'm not actually done with episode 1 yet. There is so much to this giant ray. Strangely, this is the only mission of the lot with enough coins to spawn a hundred coin shine outside the hotel. But just barely. There are, if I'm not mistaken, 101 coins around the area, over half of which are innocuously hidden in the ground and revealed by spraying. These are here to give you a lifeline as you run screaming from the Manta Storm, which is nice, but if you want to find them all, good luck, for real. You'll probably get up to about 75 by spraying and praying, but when it gets down to the wire, you'll just be running around fruitlessly spraying the same spots over and over again, just desperately hoping you'll find those magic pixels. Shout out to a fellow traveler of mine, Particular Mushroom, for making this map of every hidden coin so that I didn't have to. Once we've got the shine to appear, there's something interesting we can do with it. Spawn Phantom Manta, then lure him close to the shine and pick it up so that the collection animation despawns him. This will count as defeating him, and the game will carry out everything it would do had we not just grabbed the shine, including teleporting Mario back to the hotel manager, spawning the hotel, spawning the shine, and even resuming the music, just all behind this awkward white screen now. So fascinated was I by all that that I just accidentally hit save and continue instead of just continue and quitting, so unfortunately the rest of the hundred coin shines I spawn this episode will be transparent repeats. Sorry about that. It'll be hard, but I think we'll live. And if all that weren't enough, then there's Big Man. Some quick background for anyone who doesn't know, Splatoon started its life as a revisit to the gooping and cleaning mechanics first seen here in Sunshine, and the game even shares loose continuity with the Mario universe, some even theorizing that Inklings are the descendants of bloopers in the distant future. But Big Man here is possibly the biggest connection we have. In his boss fight in Splatoon 3, well, just watch. I never expected this to be referenced in anything, let alone this overtly, but Big Man hails from a generational clan of Manta Ninjas, who it would seem have passed down this Manta Storm technique through the ages. How do I keep going from there? It literally does not get cooler than that. Okay, episode 2, The Hotel Lobby Secret, is still pretty neat, introducing us to the main space of this level. Like Pinna Park, most of Serena Beach's missions take place within a sub-area, in this case, the hotel itself. It seems all the guests and staff are still being kept outside, though. And you know what? As long as we've got a 
chill moment here, let me show you some of the nice touches outside around the exterior. These long shadows cast by every permanent fixture are obviously just textures, but they look dang good. On a similar beat, all these sunflowers face directly towards the sun, which is some nice attention to detail. And look at this heat haze over top of the torches. Mario Sunshine actually has a persistent heat haze filter on everything about 50 feet ahead of Mario, and I believe this is the exact same effect. Some people really don't like this filter actually, and I get it. Staring at wiggly things in the distance too long makes my eyes water, but it's a clever in-theme way to hide certain draw distance animations. Like the fact that NPCs stop animating when you get too far away. Though a few elegant flourishes include draw distance increasing significantly when you go into aim mode, and more exaggerated animations persisting from greater distances. You know, I expected this Hotel Delfino sign to be different in the original Japanese version of the game, but oddly enough, it's not. Despite the island and the plaza both using Dolphic in Japanese, this is still Hotel Delfino everywhere it's referred to. Oh, hey, I think I can read this. The sun set, but love isn't over. And I think this tagline is, the place of only you and her. Aw. That's enough suspense, let's head inside. The manager invites us in to solve an apparent ghost problem, telling us, Don't be modest, I can tell you're a miracle worker. Right, so no pressure or anything. And he was not exaggerating, this place is filled to the brim with booze. So much booze, an irresponsible amount of booze, one might even say. Sunshine's iteration of them are strange looking a lot more whacked out than they've ever been in the past or future, and being vulnerable to Mario's basic stomp, and not having their signature shy behavior. These pink ones inexplicably turn into Yoshi-style platforms when sprayed with water, they're just kind of off. Something I really like about them though is their ability to disguise themselves as coins, and even blue coins. You can tell which ones are booze because rather than spinning, they always face you, and you can also reveal them with water. I love a good mimic. <laughs> what is this? In case of a fire, steel shutters will seal off the stairwells, trapping you safely in the upper floors. Please proceed calmly to your room, where you will be immolated, and no one will hear you scream. Well, with the death shutters in place, our only way up is with the pink boo platforms. Though doing this without the use of water is a fun personal challenge. One last thing before we head inside the completely safe boo portal. This death shutter at the top of the stairs reveals a neat secret to how this level is constructed. Each of the upper floors will load in or out depending on where Mario is in the hotel. This invisible wall doesn't look great, but it's one tear in an otherwise seamless transition. Now, into the boo. The hotel lobby's secret is kind of bizarre, filled with little oddities. Like these strolling stews. Hey guys, I haven't seen you in a little while. Good to see you again. Just thought I'd check in. You know, we missed you in Rico Harbor and Gelato Beach. What you been? No. Oh no, no, wait, you don't have to. Oh, no. Oh my god, why? They had so much. No. So this level is mostly constructed from breakable bricks, which we can't normally break because we can't jump up from underneath them. A lot of the ones we can break, though, have some secrets. Like this one up here, which we're gonna want. We can even death lock ourselves by making this first jump Jump utterly unfeasible. Our next obstacle are these Soren stews, which we have to use as platforms to cross these gaps. Alright, well, we don't have to, but this is a really great sink or swim moment for first time players. It's easier than it looks, but making this leap of faith the first time and pulling off these bounces feels so slick. Our next obstacle is an interesting combination of bricks and wall jumps, tasking us with clearing a path as we go. These watermelons on the side hide a coin each. Not really worth getting, but it's worth knowing that they're not worth getting. Then we have this sand block run. There's an optional, more challenging route down here. We haven't seen anything like this in not-so-secret missions before. We're rewarded with some coins for testing ourselves. I think this floodless level actually has more coins in it than any other. This last batch of watermelons and bricks has a couple more secret coins and one-ups. This one-up beneath the farthest watermelon is definitely worth getting. This one-up near the top is not. This jump isn't really something you need to risk. And then, my arch nemesis. The spinning gear platform returns. I think I've died to this specific obstacle more than any other in this game. The problem is at the end. When the gear switches directions to head back, it seems to mess with the thing's already awkward slope detection. So the key here is to jump to these sand blocks before the gear reaches the end of its path and backtracks. And then, barring anything weird with this lone stew, we can close out this level. Now of course, back in for some secret shines. For our 100 coins, the hotel exterior is barely any help. There's one in this box and almost every torch has one, but that's all for the outside. Inside, plenty of booze, a fair amount of loose coins, and one for spraying almost all these symbols above the doors. Don't forget the one in the plant in the bathroom, and I'm reasonably sure this is as many coins as we can have before heading into the boo. Should be fine, right? There's a bunch of coins within the level after all, but after gathering every single one I could find, tearing apart all these bricks and melons, we're only three quarters of the way there. And what's weird is there is a hundred coin spawn location programmed into this level. The developers assumed you might get a hundred coins here, but it's impossible without hacking. So, let's do that.
There we are, one of Sunshine's uncollectible shines. Eight red coins are next, the button is as far into the level as we've ever seen, and this one is one of the better red coin shines. Oddly enough, still none down on the optional sand path, but there's a fairly well hidden one down on the bottom of these blocks. For this alone, I think I'm gonna add this to our little list of levels that feel built around the hover nozzle. Though, of course, it's still possible without it. My criteria makes sense, right? Episode 3, Mysterious Hotel Delfino, here we go. Hold me at water gunpoint and ask me to pick my favorite episode in all of Sunshine, I'm probably gonna tell you it's Mysterious Hotel Delfino. It seems things have gone back to relatively normal since the hotel's disappearance, and now the guests are all just vibin'. Heck yeah. I'd say it's about 45 steps from here to there, wouldn't you say? Aw, uh, why would you say that? Now I have to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty. Thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five. The Doot Doot sisters are here, but they're really not feeling it, it seems. This yellow one has that rare do you need a hug vocal line. The blue one has a typical upbeat pianta laugh, but in the context of these lyrics... I guess they were paid to just keep going until everyone tuned out. That's a raw deal. We'll have to check in on them later. This mocha shell Noki couple is also worth keeping tabs on. This guy's like, ah, she just up and sprinted towards the sea. And we can actually find her down here doing zoomies, which is pretty cute on its own. Now let's head inside and get into why I proper love this episode and the level as a whole. I adore hotels. They are some of my favorite places to be, both in games and in real life. The feeling of relief when you flop onto a nice hotel bed after an exhausting day of travel, or of being far from home on an adventure but still just minutes away from a safe relaxing space of your own. It's always been euphoric to me, and this is such a well-realized space. It feels like people genuinely stay here, live here, which is such a bizarre setting for a bombastic 3D platformer like Mario, but it's brilliant. Platforming and navigational challenges take the form of bouncy beds and negotiating maze-like air vents, bodies of water for refilling flood or water feature in the lobby, or baths in the rooms. And then there's our actual challenge this episode, getting this shine in the pool. This guy, who I'm not even sure actually works for the hotel, won't let us in because we're not in proper swimwear. But we can see a hole from the ventilation over behind him. Apart from the pool, every door is locked, but this one is wide open. Don't worry, these, these Nokis are chill, don't mind them. We can use their room as an entry point to the vents, but we'll find several paths blocked by these impassable sleeping boos. All these ghosts are causing such trouble. They're everywhere. Why can't someone come and suck them up with a vacuum? Not so subtle reference to Luigi's Mansion, love that, but unless our bro does show up with a poltergust, the only thing we can find up here is a fairly useless access hatch back into the main lobby. There is a Yoshi egg down here, and we may be able to make use of Yoshi's generally more deadly suite of tools, but this egg is unique in always wanting pineapple, and wouldn't you know it, that seems to be the one thing this fruit stand doesn't have in stock. This is a puzzle. Like a proper point-and-click adventure feeling box of locks and keys that we'll have to work out bit by bit to reach the end. Or glitch through the pool window with a banana, but no! Bad. I'ma spray you with water. Mario games taking a sudden turn into a level that's more cerebral than platforming has been a thing for a while, usually in the form of ghost houses. This is another example of how Sunshine's tropical theming feels so clever. What's the resort equivalent of a haunted mansion? A haunted hotel. Genius. It's a bit of speculation, but this level, or at least part of it, may have once been an even clearer homage to the 2D ghost houses, and especially all their Lost Woods door shenanigans. In the files of this game, you can find a number of unused voice lines for Mario, and you know what? I'm not gonna spoil it for you. Just have a listen. Hello, door. Open salami. Oh, man. Another door? Aren't I done yet? There's more? Yahoo! On that subject, the voice line we hear whenever Mario gets electrocuted is actually an abridged version. So let's start working out this puzzle. This level ended up being a big snag for me as a kid who didn't want to read anything, because talking to characters around the hotel is essential here, at least to get things started. The key is this guy outside the guy's bathroom, complaining about water damage. His prominent position by the main stairs and neon green shirt do a pretty good job of subtly attracting the player's attention, too. If we investigate this water damage, we can jump up into it and find ourselves in a bathtub of one of the rooms. Incidentally, if you're really curious and investigate the same spot in the woman's room, despite the lady's protest, 
chest, you'll pop up in the tub of another room. A lot of the secrets in this episode are for the purposes of finding blue coins. However, there are no blue coins exclusive to this mission. There'll be a later level that makes finding them all far easier, so while I will be showing all the possible routes between the rooms, I won't be grabbing any blue coins unless it's by accident. Back in the first room we found, the game continues to gently guide us towards more helpful information. We can see an entrance to the room above us, which we can again reach by bouncing on the bed, but this is just the pool room again, and still on the wrong side of the glass. However, we've now learned about these flip panels in the floor, which we can navigate back down through with a simple jump, but doing that is most likely just going to bounce you right back up here. While fiddling around with that, you might spray it with your hover nozzle and see that water reveals these panels. You can immediately put this information to work and check the rest of the room for more flip panels, and find this secret one over here, enabling us to fall down without bouncing back up. Still genius. Okay, I get a really creepy vibe from this. Weird painting. But you want to know what I find even creepier than that? Imagining how you got in here. Don't worry about it, and or get used to it. She draws our attention to this artwork, which despite being a tropical landscape, or seascape, makes the shape of a boo. I think there's a name for pictures like this, like subliminal images or double images, but I'm not too sure. Either way, spray it, and that brings the boo image to the forefront, enabling us to pass straight through it into another poor unsuspecting soul's room. Don't worry, these two are already panicking because they've got ghosts, and their mirror is cursed. If we step into it just right, our reflection does some weird things that a reflection should never do. Hey, did you know it's possible to kiss your reflection but only ever on the lips? This guy's dialogue draws your attention to the closet, which you can once again spray to reveal the figure of a boo, letting you into the next room. The BIG bathroom. Better not to question it. We can get up to the third floor now. What I do question is that this room appears to be directly over the hotel's main entrance, but there doesn't seem to be a window anything like this outside. And you may be saying, man, why are you nitpicking the window continuity? And that's a valid question, but it's because the rest of the windows are spot on. Two wide windows each on either side of the first floor, the second floor has a small window and a wide window on the left side, then two small windows on the right. The top floor has three identical windows on the front, two wide windows on the right, and this long row of square windows on the left for the pool, with no windows on the back. So I am well within my rights to be confused here. So, we use the pink booze in here to gain the third floor, scare the bejesus out of yet another innocent holiday maker, flip our way past this extremely practical shelf. Honestly, I can't stop thinking about all the reasons I'd want my bookshelf to flip into the adjoining room like this. So we find ourselves in a storage room, with what look like a bunch of either spare or broken tables, couches, and other what have you. These posters on the wall are pretty neat. This swirly face is actually the same image you can see of dangling signs around Delfino Plaza, and this picture of the island, though defaced by a boo, has one interesting detail we can pick out. That being this structure, which appears to be Delfino Airstrip, being positioned directly next to the plaza, a possible remnant of a pre-release island layout. Benvenuto is Italian for welcome. Dalpic is not an Italian word, but was going to be the name of the island in the Japanese version before it was changed to Dalphic. And while we're on the subject, Sirena is Italian for siren. The, these sirens, not these ones. Which is actually a really cool namesake for a haunted hotel. Something outwardly welcoming, but truthfully terrifying. As ever, spraying the image of the boo gives us access to the next room, though this one's just for a blue coin. What we need to find here is this off-color panel in the floor, leading us to another storage room, with boxes which have our prize. Pineapple Let's get it down to Yoshi. Little blink and you'll miss a detail, Mario has a completely different animation for opening and closing these doors while carrying something. Another cool little detail, here on the front desk there's some fancy stationery, and the symbol on it is the same as these symbols above the second floor doors. The symbol above the third floor doors are these little birds, and we can see more of these symbols on the hotel facade. Speaking of doors, Yoshi, unfortunately, can't operate them, so it's lucky these Nokis have got theirs open to us. Also lucky, Yoshi is more than capable of eating ghosts. We're going full tub of blubba here, which unlocks the whole floor of vents. Here's a map of how it overlays with the third floor, so you can know which vent to pop out of for our shine, but there are a number of others we can optionally check too. I'm gonna start with this one, which pops us down at the end of the route we took getting the pineapple. Head down into the pineapple room and we can dispatch the sleeping ghost here, leading us to this nice kind of lounge room. Trouble is, again, Yoshi can't work doors, so unless we can nail these two precise spin jumps back into the ceiling, he's kind of stuck here. But you know what? That's okay, because Yoshi has a few unique properties and details I can show off now that we've got some alone time. For one, he's weirdly capable of spraying juice while you're talking to someone, which can create some hilarious conversational moments. Wait a minute, where did you come from? I'm calling for help. If you hop off Yoshi while he's spraying, he'll get stuck in this sort of Neanderthalic pose with his mouth hanging open and his arms hanging down, and his saddle weirdly detached from his body. In addition, his head will actually still follow Mario's while in aim mode, which genuinely cracks me up. Oh, and a thanks to commenter Christmas95 for pointing out this one to me. If you ground pound while Yoshi is spraying, Mario just won't flip with him. He does normally, but 
Man, this looks way funnier. Looks like our boy is finally running low on juice. Interestingly, while flashing green, his little stomach meter label will actually change from juice to fruit. I guess just in case you hadn't made that connection yet. Even more interestingly, this is different in the Japanese version of the game, where it switches from juice to hungry. Wake up, Yoshi, we're not done. There's one more room we haven't gotten into yet. And if you are worried about not being able to jump back up here with Yoshi, you can always leave him up here and circle back around. Or do whatever this is. That's cool too. Okay, so this might be the angriest any of the guests have been with our intrusion. Don't worry, miss. I'll be out of your way just as soon as I shatter your coffee table. Yo, this room has a window directly down to this room's bed. What? Well, this is the same room we got into from the women's bathroom, so we've come full circle. All that's left to do now is break into the pool, and finally, at long last, collect a shine with Yoshi. He has his own little animation where he fist bumps the camera. It's adorable. Though a ton of you let me know that you can, in fact, get Yoshi into the cage in Rico Harbor. I got a lot of comments about this, actually but Whoopar, you were the first. Good on you. And one more thing before we move on to the next episode, there's once again something noteworthy about the 100 coin shine. Three missions in a row, this is some kind of record. But this mission shine is positioned directly under this light, which drops a coin when sprayed. If we gather 99 coins, pick up this shine, and collect the 100th coin, we get this weird interaction where that shine spawns, we get our shine, and then the flood meter, or at least some of it, is present on the save screen. No time to dwell on that though, we're not even halfway through this place. Episode 4. The Secret of Casino Delfino. You should be heading home. Do 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 do. It's so dark and you're all alone. Do 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 do. Actually, this is probably the least things have changed between two episodes, at least outside. Everyone's doing exactly what they were last episode. Most of them even say the exact same thing, which almost never happens. So we ought to just head in. We've been invited to the casino, and might I just say, Casino Delfino is a great name. Of course, it helps that Casino is an Italian diminutive of Casa. By the way, that's why in a casino you're always playing against the house. But while we could book it to the elevator and go about gambling, there's a whole hotel of people up here. Thanks to Mario, our hotel is once again cozy and respectable. Yeah, there we go. Getting the respect I deserve, now we're talking. This Noki in the open room is one of the very few named islanders in this game. Apparently her name is Linguini? Okay. Great. While we're running around the place, I am going to grab as many coins as I can find yet again. And Vent Janitor is going to call me out on it while I'm at it. But it's not my fault this episode has so many sub areas. There are a few more amusing dialogue boxes, but I don't want to dwell too long up here. There's gambling to be done. Down in the casino, there's an exceptionally well hidden one up you can get for spraying the light in the elevator. And we're going to set about getting as many coins as we can by ground pounding all these slot machines. This honestly isn't a bad mission to go for the 100 coin shine, as these slot machines are basically the biggest concentrations in the level. So here's its spawn location if we get it down here. Obviously, once again, there are some great environmental embellishments around. These Pianta torches are really cute. The ceiling is crazy. If we look close enough at these slot machines, we can make out the word Splash, which is... Yeah, and I really like these palm tree lamps. Curiously, only this one can be climbed like a normal palm tree. I say normal, latching on is weirdly precise, which makes me assume the others might also be climbable, but you'd need to be in just the right angle or something. Onto the task at hand. We've gotta win it big. Triple sevens on both these jumbo slots. The one on the left is a gimme, since you can spin these slots individually. Yeah, that's totally how that should work. This right one you just gotta play straight, but you actually do get the payouts if something other than sevens line up, including booze. Your honor, the casino sticks actual monsters on their patrons on purpose? No, they don't, Your Honor. What? No. Yes. No. But no. Guilty. What? Who? You. What? Life in prison. What? No parole. Why? As long as I'm fiddling with these, this casino is another instance of an area we can never bring Yoshi to, but does have a Yoshi version of the music. Have a listen. Here's the hotel exterior. If we line up all those sevens, we get our prize. You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! This is not a prize. A big old flip panel puzzle where we gotta reveal the whole picture of the shine. This is unforgivably bad. I don't even have to explain it. Just watch me try to do this. No playing it up, I promise. Thank <laughs> you. 
only thing remotely resembling a strategy you can have is to prioritize the upper panels over the lower ones, and the inner panels over the outer ones, but for real, good luck. Now we get our prize. Not a shine, but a pipe. Your Honor, this casino's grand prize is a death course? Okay, despite these flip panels being genuinely awful, this is one of my favorite not-so-secret levels. A big part of that is this unique background, and the added atmosphere of the seagulls. No other floodless course has this going on. If you look behind you, you can see the night sky and stars fading in. This does seem to be the same skybox as the exterior of Serena Beach, but I suppose they just really wanted us to have a chance to appreciate it, and rightly so, I mean, come on. The obstacle course itself is nothing crazy. You'll probably want to be extra sure not to get a game over, because it'll take you like 20 minutes to get back in here, but as long as you don't hesitate over these spinning cubes, you should be just fine. I do recommend snagging this one up though. That is unless it's for some reason spawned over the ledge. I have no idea what causes this to happen, though I suspect it's probably something to do with loading in while its space is occupied by these cubes. They are a little finicky after all. Check out what happens if you try to push against one while it moves away from you. Even better, trying to move away from it while it moves towards you. Let's go. It's a Mario time! These wooden pegs also have a weird property. If the front of one touches you, it instantly crushes you, no mercy. Alternatively, with the hover nozzle, you can fly straight through it. All a little odd, but that's been Serena in a nutshell, hasn't it? Now, I know what you're thinking. I'm about to gather 100 coins again before jumping back into the mission and putting myself through this hell again. Well, I love that you're participating, but unfortunately this time you're wrong on both counts. For one, this is our second instance of a not-so-secret level with nary a coin to be found, so there'd be no point in collecting any outside. However, much like the secret of the Dirty Lake, despite its lack of coins, it still has a 100 coin shine spawn location. So if I edit a coin into the level, I can show you guys yet another uncollectible shine. It's especially satisfying to see all three of this mission shines right next to each other. But back in the unhacked version of the game, we're still going to need to get back in there for the red coin shine. However, there is, mercifully, an easy way to avoid all the hassle. Jump up on your fountain of choice, then make a big wall jump up to the top of this invisible wall here. From here, all you gotta do is strafe walk your way to fall behind the curtain. That skips the slot machines and lets you do the shine flip puzzle from closer up than before, which actually does make it significantly easier. However, what we really want to do is skip this shine puzzle entirely. It's a little tougher, but start hovering just as you fall down from strafing and you can hover through the ceiling behind the puzzle and to the pipe. You can still flip the picture from behind if you feel so inclined, though you don't, and we can go after our red button. None of these coins are too tricky, but as a whole they're pretty funny, with all eight of them being laid out in a perfectly straight line. Episode 5, I hope you didn't think we were done collecting 100 coins, it's King Boo down below. This is genuinely the one I'd recommend doing the 100 coin shine on, so follow along if that's your bag. What are you thinking? It's time to go! Dee -doo, dee doo Get yourself a clue! Can't play no more! Dee -doo -doo -doo. Steady on, mates, this is only episode 5. It's really hard to appreciate the sunset through your noggin. First of all, how dare you? Second of all, Mario's noggin is an improvement on any vista. Yeah, once again, things out here are basically the same as they were in episode 3, so let's coin things up and head inside. Seems trouble might be afoot based on the manager's slightly less welcoming welcome. Inside the hotel, we have a first for us. This hotel map is one-to-one -one identical to that of the last episode. Every coin, every NPC, all their dialogue, copy and paste it over. I'd be disappointed, but it honestly makes my job here way easier. The manager's dialogue being unchanged is funny, though. Just, yeah, enjoy yourself in the casino where everything is certifiably fine. Don't worry about scraping together every coin you can find. Just gather all the large groups up and head into the casino. Things are looking a bit more haunted this time. Maybe you shouldn't have put ghosts in the machine, I don't know. Now this is the only episode where we can get every blue coin in the casino, of which there are three. One for spraying this torch, one for ground pounding this slot machine, and one for the biggest M graffiti we've ever seen over the elevator. Now let's pound this purple roulette square and head on down to another one of the weirdest boss fights in the game. King Boo has some kind of something going on. You've got this, this, and all oh, this. Let's just say I have a lot to talk about. King Boo's boss fight is centered around his slot reels. Spray them and watch them go. They have five possible outcomes. Coins, fruit, stews, unknown, and no match. On a normal playthrough, fruit's the only one you care about. He'll spit out a whole variety, though never bananas, oddly. Guess he's aware of their power. A nice touch, hitting him with one covers him in juice the same color Yoshi turns from eating that fruit, though none seem to actually affect him. You gotta hit him with a pepper. This is the only area besides the plaza those ever show up. 
and then hit him with any other fruit. Three times the charm, or however that goes, and you don't even have to engage with any other aspect of this fight. If you see the slots lining up anything you don't want, just rush him and he'll cancel it, and pop up again for a fresh spin. But Nintendo programmed in a truckload of unique bits and bobs to this fight, so you can bet I'm going over them. For starters, did you know that you can douse King Boo's flaming tongue for him? It doesn't accomplish anything productive, but it's a combination of elements that makes sense. The next jackpot I care about is coins. Odds are pretty good you've never actually seen him roll coins before, and that's because the actual chances are slim to none. Unless you're at 3 health or less, at which point the chances for coins goes up exponentially. You can do this as many times as you can survive the cycle, so that does make this our second instance of an infinite source of coins. I'm not grinding this one up to 999 though. I estimate that would take multiple hours, and even I have a limit. It does make it pretty easy to hit 100 coins though, and get what I'm confident is labeling as the weirdest shine location in the game. It's just... Not quite centered over King Boo, but behind his left shoulder. The perspective with the locked camera is really tough too. I actually died trying to get this. When Mario does get it, he completely clips through the floor. This is a bit of a mess. Next is Stews, which I thought was gonna be pretty simple, but I went around the blocks with this guy for like 20 minutes and he didn't land on it once. Eventually, I realized that this attack depends entirely on how many hits you've gotten on him. And in his final phase, he almost never lands on Stews. In his first phase, they will always spawn a batch of strollin' Stews. In his second or third, he'll launch a small platoon of Smolderin' Stews at you, making this the only appearance of Smolderin' Stews outside Pinna Beach. And you can easily go this whole game without seeing him. I did find out that, unique from the Pinna Park ones, these guys splat green when kicked into the wall. Gross. On the subject of phases, it's also worth noting that these roulette wheels get faster each hit as well. Mystery is the worst. He'll launch three pairs of random enemies at you, and you need to pray the set doesn't contain blue cataquacks. Even though they don't hurt you, they are extremely annoying when paired with anything else, especially the Electrocoopas. Oh. My. God. This attack can also spawn poinks, bob-ombs, bloopers, more stews, and cheap cheeps. This is the only time we'll ever see grounded cheap cheeps, which have some unique properties. We can stomp them, which we can't usually do, and we can also send them ricocheting off the walls. The bob-ombs are interesting too. If you manage to evade the other enemies long enough to spray one and throw it at King Boo, he will react by spitting out boos at you. You get it? He's booing your attack. The last possibility is a mismatch, in which case he'll slobber a bunch of bubbles at you. These bubbles are weird. They chase you and constantly multiply, but they also constantly disappear because there's a pretty strict cap on how many can be on the field. They're guaranteed to drop big water bottles, but unlike coins, this roll doesn't seem weighted when you're running low on water. His last attack is just what he does when he gets impatient for you to spin the wheel. He'll summon an endless barrage of boos at you. These boos are actually unique from the ones upstairs. They never turn invisible and they get launched away by water, but he'll just keep summoning till you spin. You can get up to 50 boos in the arena before they start despawning. I, uh, <laughs> I guess you could call these ones dead on arrival. It's highly unlikely, but I like to think they chose the number 50 as the cap as another deliberate reference to Luigi's Mansion, which had exactly 50 boos to capture in all. Stomping on them occasionally yields water bottles, which will make them your only chance at water if you run empty and can't spin the wheel. But honestly, no way you're in this fight that long. Once he's down and we've got the space to ourselves, incidentally, he'll always splatter with the color of whatever fruit laid the finishing blow. We can take advantage of the weird camera fixed to the wall and do this. When I tell you to mamma mia, I expect you. To mamma mia. Episode 6, Scrubbing Serena Beach. I gather people really don't like this one, actually. The goop is back. Where? Everywhere! Well, that wasn't really my question. I mean, I can see it. I'm actually wondering, like... How? This electric goop is pretty much exclusively associated with Phantom Manta, but this doesn't look like one of their trails. In fact, it actually looks like a boo if we take a look at it from overhead. Well, we've got three minutes to clean it all up, and of course, if we don't manage that, our nap is rudely interrupted with a swift and painful death. But this time limit is really no big deal. We have tons of time and tons of options. We can throw these water barrels provided to us, we can use our sprinkler technique, spam the flood burst. Honestly, even if you take your time spraying back and forth, you shouldn't have much issue wrapping this up. So while I've got a minute here, I want to talk about pollution maps. The code running under the surface of any level with goop. The shape it starts in, where it can be spread to, whether or not it can spawn goobles in spot A or spot B. All that good stuff. But it's not just levels with goop, there are also unused pollution maps for almost every level of the game, including floodless missions. And the developers pretty clearly had a lot of fun with these, using them to draw doodles. Hey look, it's Kug again. They can write words and various other cryptic what have you. Don't worry too much about all these numbers, they're probably just file designations, but this one might be worth worrying about. 
about. Shout out to Super Mario Broth for loading this map into the actual game, and subsequently giving me nightmares. So this level actually has an interesting regional difference in difficulty. That's been known to happen. There was that one time Nintendo withheld an entire Mario game from the West because it was deemed too difficult. To be fair, they were probably right. Now, if you know this game almost as well as I do, you might be ready to hear me tell you that the Japanese version is much harder, because in the international release we only have to clean 95% of the goo, giving us a generous margin of error. But in the Japanese version, the goal is 99%, making these little micro specks of goo much more critical to clean. This, unfortunately, is not entirely accurate, despite being corroborated by some pretty reputable sources. The Japanese version requires players to clean 99% of the gloop in order to complete the mission, while only 95% needs to be cleaned in the western version. Believing it to be true, I methodically reduced this last square of goo as little as possible to get a visual of exactly how much 5% was, and it was quite small. Golly, I said. If that's what 5% looks like, then 1% must be brutal. And I booted up the Japanese version to try it for myself, because I'm a masochist. And then, I won with all this stuff up here. Once again, I went back in and methodically cleaned to whittle down to this last square bit by bit, and was very puzzled to see just how much more lenient this level was in Japanese. Now, I don't have the internal numbers, but I would guess that this in the Japanese version is 5%, and this in the North American version is 1%. But then it gets weirder, because this 1% deal is the case in the 3D All-Stars version, but not the case in any of the GameCube releases. I even checked the PAL version. So where did this idea that the Japanese version is so strict come from? My only guess is that it may have been the case in the extremely elusive 1.0 release of Sunshine in Japanese, since the version I have is the far more common 1.1 release. But unfortunately, I have no way of checking. What this would mean though is that the version of Mario Sunshine that was used as a foundation for Mario 3D All-Stars would be the original, unupdated version. On a similar note, there's a hilarious glitch in the Switch version of this game that makes it so seemingly at complete random, the mission will just declare itself finished, regardless of how much you've actually cleaned. I bet speedrunners would love to know how to pull this off consistently. Before we we move on from this, let's talk a little bit more about the mission itself. Like I said, I gather that people tend not to like it, but I'm not sure why, apart from maybe the timer being a bit stressful. If anything, I wish we'd gotten more missions like this in exchange for some of this game's red coin hunts. Same scavenger hunt principle, but testing a different aspect of Mario's moveset. I think they could have done a lot more with this, but oh well. Since we can't even go in the hotel, this level is refreshingly simple, but there are a couple more details of note. For starters, these four submerged Nokis all have blue coins, two of which are exclusive to this level, but the other two can also be gotten in episode 1, so we're gonna snag all those and tee ourselves up for the rest in the blue coin montage. I'm actually surprised I haven't mentioned this yet, if you come back into this mission and clean an NPC you've already gotten a blue coin from, they'll give you a 1-up instead. This mission also has something unique to mention about its 100 coin shine. There's only like 10 coins out here, so you'd never see it without hacking, but if you do spawn the shine before cleaning the beach, the hurry up and clean music just stops. You've still got the timer, but the chill beach music to accompany it. And since the shine actually appears over the goo, we can see that when Mario picks it up, he still winces in pain as his shock animation is otherwise overridden by the shine animation. Ow! Last thing I want to talk about are these barrels. There are more in this mission than in any other level, and they're just hilariously jank. I could honestly make a whole game breakdown just about these, because the amount of weird properties and glitches they have is staggering. But at least for now, I just want to throw them this honorable mention. Episode 7, you know what time it is, Shadow Mario checks in. Looks like our gooey boy has caused yet another evacuation. And these people are downright sick of it. Shout out to this Noki though. I don't know, there's just something about his voice line I really like. Also shout out to the hotel manager for actually knowing the troublemaker isn't us. It cannot be that hard. I swear. Inside the hotel, it's just us two Marios and the staff, and this Mario, and this one. Yeah, actually, this is probably the most interesting Shadow Mario chase in the game. All the room doors are open, and this time he makes use of all kinds of tricks to get you off his tail. Navigating in and out of these rooms, using shortcuts, and these boos, disguised as his doubles, though off color, can distract you long enough for him to genuinely give you the slip. You'll probably end up having to track him down by the proximity to his music alone. This is actually a challenge, and a completely unique one from every other chase. Bravo. Another new addition to his bag of tricks, he now chooses his route at complete random when Mario gets close to him at one of his stands spots, so sometimes he'll run right towards you, and fairly often get a hit on you in the process. I love that for him, but it makes it really hard to get him to go up to the third floor on command. I want to get him up there so I can show an odd quirk to his coding. Ordinarily, if he takes this route through the storage room, he'll hop down through this panel and then head back to the lobby. However, if we manage to beat him to the panel and flip it using Flood, he'll fall through before jumping, and that will completely throw off his groove, causing him to run straight into this wall for a second before... 
He'll reappear back in the lobby, but I love what this reveals about how he works. He's not programmed and animated along a path, he's programmed with a set of inputs, which he receives just like Mario does. Kinda like how Super Smash Bros. saves game replays. Nintendo's thrifty with memory that way. Well, with his shine in the bag, we've got just one more mission to go. Episode 8, Red Coins in the Hotel, and as with many Episode 8s, things are back to the status quo, but with a couple happy turnouts. The Zumi Noki finally managed to get her fella to Zumi with her, and even the Doot Doot sisters seem to have gotten a second wind. Well, um, maybe. Inside the hotel, we're greeted with a familiar red button, and it's really funny that the challenge doesn't just start automatically upon getting here like it did in episode 6, cause that gives us the opportunity to run through the hotel and open up all the shortcuts in preparation for the timer. We can even catch up with some good friends, and the occasional soothsayer who have somehow managed to predict the ensuing appearance of red coins. Pizza 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 With all our prep out of the way, let's stomp that button and do this right. We get a full 5 minutes for this, possibly the longest timer in this game. We could probably check every room twice over with that, but I'm sure they wanted to give people who didn't have this hotel memorized a shot. These red coins are essentially laid out along the critical path of episode 3, apart from this one in the women's room. There's one in the common space of each floor, one in the room with the haunted closet, one in the pool, one behind the boo poster, and one more in the storage room's hole in the wall. That was really no problem. In fact, a bit of a weird note to end what I feel has been the most creative level so far. Essentially, it's just a timer test of how well we remember the hotel. Well, I must say, I remember it extremely fondly, but I'm jumping the gun sounding like I'm wrapping up when we haven't even done our blue coins yet. Serena Beach with its plethora of sub areas and maps is gonna get a pretty unique treatment here. Starting with the recap we have the casino, only accessible in two missions, both of which have these two coins here but only episode 5 has this one. Similarly, around the hotel exterior, these two coins for cleaning off Noki can be found here in episode 1 but here in episode 6, and episode 6 also has two more rescue coins. Lovely. All 23 of the rest are available in episode 7 and 8, but 7's the clear choice since all the doors are open. Starting off on the beach, we have one out here in the sea. I know it's a little early in the coins to be getting sidetracked, but if you swim all the way out to the level boundary, you can kind of break the rest of the island's force perspective, and see the Bianco Hills viewing platform probably way closer than it should look. Same with Pinna Island, you can really tell how small it is from this angle. And what the heck, let's pull the camera out and see what we can see. Pinna Island has a surprising amount of detail. I mean, it's only the wheel and the coaster, but still. Apart from that and the Bianco viewing deck, that's it. Nothing else on the whole island this time. It's fine, you'd have to be really dedicated to notice, but it's at least a little weird we can't see any part of Gelato Beach or Rico Harbor. Right, sorry, coins. There's one for spraying this stone tablet here, which I must have accidentally revealed like a dozen times while getting footage for episode 6. One hidden high up beneath this cabana roof, a big ol' M graffiti on this wall over here, one for being a good Samaritan and watering this patch of sunflowers, one high up on the hotel's back wall, and our last one outside is for squirting this torch second from the left. Just over half of them to go. Inside the ground floor we have a triangle mark that gives us a remarkably unhelpful preview of the the second floor. The timer on this one's pretty quick, you won't get it by taking the stairs. The triangle up here actually reveals the other blue coin properly. Cheers for that. The second floor has one sitting out in the northeast room, one in the east room, one in a box in the southeast room, an X mark once again directs us to the next floor up, and this one you can take the stairs for. The northeast room on the third floor has a blue shine hidden in its mirror, clean this M next to the stairs, spray the light over the totem pole to pop out a coin, there's one sitting in the east room, in the southeast room we're gonna spray this totally conspicuous and obviously secret concealing shelf, then do the same thing to this totally conspicuous and obviously secret concealing lamp in the common space. I'm easily amused, and I find the fact that you can spray the panel beneath the shelf coin to make it drop to the second floor, easily amusing. And finally, let's head up to the vents for our last handful. Look around this area by the east wall to find a lone boo lurking about, and stomp him for a boo coin. There's one tucked away in this dead end here, and finally, an M graffiti in the central chamber by the light. And that's my favorite level checked out. We've got a proper wall of shines on our totals page now, don't we? Serena Beach is a fantastic time. Only one stumbling point to speak of, and I love its placement in the game too. It's essentially the introduction of the game's second half of levels, which are all going to be a bit more thoughtful than the first. Not quite to this level of puzzle, but Hotel Delfino's willingness to get your brain in gear in the most relaxing setting of all is a pretty classy move. Well, relaxing when it's not terrifying, but even then, that breathtaking sunset does a lot to set me at ease. Hey, speaking of the sun, did you notice that this was our first level without a sunglasses guy, inside or outside? Well, hopefully we'll see him again soon, just like you guys. My segues are on point today. Next time, we're breaking down Noki Bay, home to some of the most famous secrets in this game. Can't wait to see that video? Well, you and all the rest of my patrons can see it right now on Patreon. Link in the description. Speaking of those amazing patrons, an enormous excessive shout out to my top patron, Gabe R, who is the only man to have ever driven two and a half cars at once. An obsessive thank you to Janku, Marcel S, Drooling, 
Chris Braydell, and Andrew Mintern, and all the rest of you legends out there. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.